ladies and gentlemen, we're very lucky today. We've got a very special guest with us, uh, and uh, especially for Arena's party. Um, I saw this man when I was a teenager, and he, he, he was one of my musical heroes. And uh, Irena actually sung on one of his records. Oh, really? So, wow, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Edgar Broughton. <laughs> Yeah. 
unfortunate to watch afternoon telly. Which occasionally it happens, doesn't it? You go around somebody's house and it's not busy. Calm down. No, I'm not knocking anything. I'm just saying, you know, it, it is an unavoidable thing. But one of the most distressing things about afternoon telly is the adverts, some of the adverts. You've all seen that little black girl with flies around her mouth and her eyes, yeah? <coughs> and sometimes it's a little black boy. And I hate seeing it, you know. I'm sick and tired of seeing it. But it'll be there, I guess, because there's no sea change on the horizon, you know. We are going to continue to do what we do, it seems, until we can't do it anymore. Without that sea change, that real change, we're kind of stuck with ourselves, which on a bad day is not a very nice place to be, but on a good day it's wonderful, isn't it? So, what am I talking about and why? It would be nice if the refugees had somewhere to go where they were welcome. Remember what happened to the Jews who had nowhere to go and so on. We, we've heard all this stuff over the last weeks. Focus on this little kid for a moment. This is called On The News.
once going to play a festival in Germany. And it was like really early in the morning. Well, it was about half past six. And for me, half past six is the middle of the night, actually. So I was a bit grumpy and tired and fed up. I mean, already been delayed uh, one day by the snow and the, the weather. So I get on this plane and there's no reserved seat, so I'm determined that I'm going to sit by the window and go to sleep. And this guy, elderly chap, I'd like to think he was older than me, <laughs> pushed past me and took the window seat. So I sat down and I thought to myself, all right, you wait till you need a piss. Because I knew we would. And when I sleep, I sleep. Anyway, I thought I was still going to go to sleep, but this guy was determined. He, he was on a mission. And he turned around to me and he said, what do you do? So I said, I'm a guitar player, I sing, I'm in a band, and I'm going to play a festival in Herzberg, Germany. And I thought, that'll do him, that'll shut him up. And he said, uh, he, he said a couple more things, and then I felt obliged, didn't I? I had to say, what do you do? Okay. So he said, well, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, kind of, but could be interesting. You know, I spent a lot of my life sitting on trains and planes and boats and shit, in a car, talking to somebody I didn't really want to meet, but afterwards I quite enjoyed it. Or, it was a valuable experience. So being positive, I decided, all right, I will talk to him. So I said, so what, what do you do then? You know, I asked you what you did, and you said, I'm a Jehovah's Witness, what do you do? He said, well, I travel the world, looking at the holy sites and recording things. I thought, that sounds like a nice job. You got it, you got it, right? So I thought, I wonder if he plays guitar. Because I fancied it. So I said, where have you been? He said, well, I've just come back from Glastonbury and uh, Stonehenge and the Rollwright Stones. And he listed off all these wonderful, wonderful places within these aisles. And he said, I've been to the pyramids in South, uh, sorry, the, the runways in South America. He said, I was half a year at the pyramids last year. I said, so what do you actually do? He said, well, I interview people about the second coming. <laughs> Looking for signs. Well, my first response was to giggle a bit. But then I thought, well, I'll play along. So I said, the signs? He said, well, you know, some of the angels have already landed. So I said, is that right? He said, yeah, yeah. I said, which ones? He said, well, guess. Well, if you look around the world, it's easy to pick out some of the dark ones, isn't it? Yeah. You know, I mean, Mr. Putin is making a big uh, push at the moment to be Archangel, I would think, if that's kind of the way it is. Anyway. Cameron. I suddenly, yeah, Cameron. So it suddenly occurred to me. Don't even give him that. What a fantastic job. And these people really believe this. They're end timers. Well, you probably know the end timers in America, in America were mostly formed by oil people. So the big end timers who believe that the end is nigh are oil millionaires. So if they lose a ship, on some beach and fuck up the ecosystem. Well, it's predicted in Revelations, isn't it? The skies will be green, the earth, and, and so on and so on, will die. So if they speed it up, you know, the rapture, as they call it, will come when all the good ones will be rushed up to heaven. Blondie. This is quite an interesting concept. Anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, he found out little about me, I'm glad to tell you. <laughs> but at the very end of it, just as we were having this really wobbly landing in Frankfurt, he turned around to me and he said, would you like to buy a copy of Watchtower? <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of, it went from being not very good to quite interesting to being really banal again. <laughs> I 
said I wanted to be clean. He said I needed to be saved. He was talking about the rapture. Now it has to get much worse. He thought he was going to heaven. Screaming at a nurse. Mm -hmm. Mama, there's a hole in it. No, 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 no. It was okay, but overrated. I can tell you stories that make your hair curl about the darker side. But anyway, um, I love it now. I, I, I really like being in this room with all you people right now. Don't want to be anywhere else. Now is where it is, okay? And that's how I kind of try to live my life. The odd heart attack interrupts me, but there you go. So... That said, the good old days, the good old days, I mean, for me there isn't any such thing. If you're young and kicking, it's today, isn't it? It's, it's their good old days, or the beginning of it. So I won't have that truck with all those people who invite me for a coffee and then want to sort of play Jefferson Starship and Moby Grape and, you know, drag me back into that thing. And all those people that say, you know, I mean, I was doing a church gig on my own not very long ago and this woman came up, she said, are you going to play Out Demons Out in a church? Hallelujah. And also, as I've said before, I am not a musician. I write songs and I sing the songs I write. And this is one of them and it's called The Good Old Days. Hey. Still, we are here, we love 
cheeks turn pale in the brown she It's far out there watching the white lines go by. Just like time flies for everybody else. And the racing cyclists still we are here. He still said, I am not going on after him. I quite like that. <laughs> anyway, anyway, somebody took me. I must tell you this story, I hope you don't mind. The Edgar Broughton Band, well, EMI, they never ask you. They release the box set. What happens is the record company say, Have you got any unreleased private tracks or anything? You say, Well, yeah, we've got. And they snatch it, and that becomes the extra tracks so they can re-release something they've released 20 times in a new format. Anyway, they made a good job of this complete box set of the four EMI albums. And I thought, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, it's a body of work I'm not entirely dissatisfied with. And Mick Farron wrote, as a review, in name, it be nonsense. <laughs> and I thought, you cheeky. When you think of the shit that he <laughs> anyway, anyway, we won't go there, but I determined that if ever I saw him again, 
because somebody told me he looked very ill at a gig. They said, oh, you should see him, man. He, he can't walk. And I thought, what do you mean? This used to be a slim, you know, thin, dressed in black, wicker wicker shoes, you know, white panther, in fact. So, um, I decided when I saw him, I was going to go up to him and say, mate, can I buy you a brandy? Can I buy you ten brandies? You little shit. <laughs> anyway, suddenly we're playing a gig together at the borderline, okay? So I go in what they laughingly call the green room. <laughs> Not as nice as out there. Anyway, there's this enormous... Okay, I'm a big chap, I know, I know. But there's this enormous gargantuan chap sitting, dressed in black, with wickle pickers with his feet bulging out of them. And his tongue's hanging out, and I said, You must be Mick. He said, Mick, how are you? And he's talking like that, and he's there. How's he going to sing? I mean, how could he ever sing? But how's he going to sing now, you know? Anyway, um, it's quite funny. I thought, well, I can't. I can't say you look terrible because he looked worse than I thought he looked. Okay. Anyway, the band went on and I went out to check them out before Mick went on to do his thing. You know, he liked to have a little intro and, you know, get it all going and then he'd sort of come out and do his thing, you see. So I go out to check out the band and this is unlike me. I said to a friend, I've got to go backstage because otherwise I will laugh so much it will, it will look so terrible. So I, I, I went out into the back. And there he is sitting there, he said, Are oh, you alright? Are you alright? Oh, yeah. I said, Yeah, I'm alright, Mick. How are you doing? He said, Yeah, I'm cool, I'm cool. Anyway, he got up to go to the stage, which was at least a 20 yard walk. And as he got up, I saw for the first time a cylinder of oxygen with a breathing, breathing mask. And the first thing I thought, what person that loves you would let you go to a gig with a cylinder of oxygen? I mean, it's not Bruce Springsteen on his last legs, sold out in Madison Square Gardens three nights, and he's got to appear, you know? So I was shocked. Anyway, <laughs> so he goes on stage and he dropped dead within about 10 seconds. He hadn't even sung the first line of his song. But I say drop dead, I mean paramedics, the whole thing, you know. And the drummer coming up to me in the middle of this, he's lying on the floor 15 feet from me on his side, because I suggested put him in the recovery position. Everybody else was just... And I expected the audience to get Chris out and watch until I told the promoter to get rid of the audience. It was all a bit weird. Then the drummer comes over to me, I swear this is the truth. And he says, listen, he says, Edgar, he says, no matter what the outcome is here, he said, how about you and your brother, the drummer, come in and join the Pink Fairies and we'll do all that. <laughs> I swear it. And next line on the floor. Anyway. Uh, yes. I thought about it and I thought, what an ignominious way to go, actually. Some, some fool said to me later, oh, he died with his boots on on stage. Any day you need 
Oh, no.